Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Our Lady, Queen of Peace, pray for us. Our guardian angels and patron saints, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, it has been an active couple of days since I arrived here in Knoxville. On Saturday afternoon, I arrived late afternoon. It was a very full day on Sunday, and we've had mission talks the last couple of nights. And so we conclude the mission tonight. And I just want to tell Father McNeely how brilliant I think that he is in having the the parish come for a parish mission to jump off into Lent. And so I want to thank him for the opportunity to be here. And whether or not it all was intended that way, it sure worked out pretty well. So I think that it's been a, a good couple of nights, and we, we jump into Lent, hopefully for a very fruitful Lenten season. And this concluding talk tonight specifically has to do with adoration of the Eucharist and family holiness. And where is the, where is the intersection of family life and the Eucharist as it's involved in your lives as Catholic at Catholics, Catholic individuals as singles, but certainly Catholic families. And I remember very distinctly, I have fond memories of driving to our parish church, which was St. Paul's Catholic Church in Angeles, Kansas, which was just a little prairie church. You could see the steeple of the church from about eight miles away, seven or eight miles. Before they were having trouble in the uh, bell tower, with the, uh, they were worried about the structural integrity of the, the, um, the steeple, you used to be able to hear the Angelus bells rung at 8 o'clock, noon, and 6 in the evening. And so I, that place of worship, that center of the Eucharist in that little rural farming community was one that was, it's just very near and dear to my heart. We used to go to Mass there every Sunday, and it was very easy for us to go to Mass, and how blessed we were, and how blessed we still are as Americans, even though there are are issues with religious liberty in the country, still it's pretty easy for us to to travel, to go to Mass, and to go to pray, and to go together as a family, to go to worship. And so, for you as Catholics, for you as as families, if you're single, but, but to... Really, in this Lenten season, look at the opportunities that you have for worship, specifically for Eucharistic adoration, adoring our Lord, and and coming together to pray as a a community, to take advantage of those times for your own own personal devotion, but also coming together to pray for your local church, but for the, the, the worldwide church as well. The Lord, he doesn't necessarily need more long prayers from you, but he certainly wants the praying that you do to be very intentional, very intense, and he wants you to to consider, how is it that I'm praying? You don't necessarily need to add, add more novenas and so forth, because just a little time in front of the Eucharistic Lord, you don't, there's no telling what kind of fruit that can bear. And so in the Lenten season, even if you can only go to, if you were able to go to daily Mass even once a week during Lent, if your schedule permits it, try to, try to do that, to come together and form this habit of Eucharistic worship, because the Eucharist is the source and summit of our lives as Catholics. I'd like to read for you a quote from Lumen Gentium, the document from the Second Vatican Council, and it's specifically the the paragraph on the laity and the work of the laity in the church. I'm going to read it now, and then I'm going to reflect on it a little more later on. But it has to do with family life and how it connects with the Eucharist. This is, uh, I think it's chapter 7 in in, uh, Lumen Gentium. It's paragraph 34. 
for all their works, prayers, and apostolic undertakings, family and married life, daily work, relaxation of mind and body, if they are accomplished in the spirit, indeed, even the hardships of life, if patiently borne, all these become spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. In the celebration of the Eucharist, these may most fittingly be offered to the Father along with the body of the Lord. And so, worshiping everywhere by their holy actions, the laity consecrate the world itself to God. The laity assist in sanctifying the world through your work, through your prayers, through your apostolic undertakings, married and daily work life, through your vacations and recreation, through your hardships. All of you help to sanctify the world. That's why it's really important that you have a connection with the Eucharistic Jesus, because all of you go places that clergy and religious can't go because we're busy with different things. We're busy with the work and administration of the church, but all of you are out in the world and you're, you're the missionaries, you're the soldiers out in the world who can help to sanctify, help to be the good Catholic witnesses out there. And so it is vital, it is vital that all of you have a deep love of the Eucharistic Jesus so that he can strengthen you so that you can, in those times of trial, be those good soldiers and be those witnesses when you go out to the world, when you're out at Kroger, when you're out and, you know, wh whatever it is, the work you're doing, you can be that, that strong witness. When we look at, I mentioned last night, looking at the Eucharist in terms of, in three different ways, I talked about the presence, the present sacrament, sacrifice sacrament, and communion sacrament. There's, these are three different ways. We think about receiving Jesus in Holy Communion, but also we, it, it is still, he is still truly present, and we have this time of adoration when we focus on him, the, the presence sacrament. But tonight I want to think about the fact that the Eucharist is a sacrifice sacrament, that when we go to Mass, it is like we are at Calvary, and it is the one sacrifice of Jesus made present down through time, down through the generations. And Jesus can do that because he died on Good Friday, but he ascended on ascension. When he, when he ascended into heaven, he took, and all those fruits are borne down through all the ages and are showered down upon our altars when we go to Mass. Because God isn't bound by time and space. And so, looking at the Eucharist as a sacrifice sacrament, and thinking about family life and the, and the ways that there are sacrifices in, in family life. I want, I want to really kind of draw a connection there between the Eucharist as a sacrifice sacrament, Jesus dying on the cross for us and all of that he suffered and all of the love that he uh, bore in, in, in shedding his blood. But how is it that you too through your own sacrifices, maybe as, as married, or even as single people living in the world, how do you enter into that sacrifice? Because we know the sacrament of marriage is that covenant of love whereby a man and a woman are committed in a lifelong commitment before God. And this union, we know, is for the good of the spouses, and it is open to the generation of new life. So those are the two ends of marriage. It is for the good of the spouses and the generation being open to the generation of new life. This is part of this lifelong covenant of marriage. And you, you know, for those of you who are married or, or who have been married, you know that there are sacrifices in marriage. You've probably heard of the three rings of marriage. There's the engagement ring, the wedding ring, and the suffer ring. And spouses make an offering of themselves in this sacrament. And God gives you the grace that you need. But there's something very special within marriage. 
Spouses say to one another, in the marital covenant, in the marital act, this is my body given for you. And this is said to one another, and this is, this is a powerful, beautiful relationship that parents also potentially become co-creators with God and parents be welcoming new life. A wife understands that in the sacrifice, she's going to give literally body and blood in nurturing a life as she carries a baby around for nine months and gives birth, nurses a child, cleans up after a child. The father understands he's going to give of himself as well because he is going to have blood, sweat, and tears and a lot of money invested in raising children and time. But these are, these are joy-filled aspects if we, we go about them with the, with the right attitude, if we go about them asking God's help and we continue to work at it, being open to the, the uh, suggestions, you know, that, that uh, hopefully we're trying to educate ourselves as, as mothers and as fathers. But there is that, there, there's real sacrifice invested in this. There's beautiful examples of parenthood that we see down through the ages. Especially, I mean, and I'll talk a little more about Joseph and Mary in, in a little bit. But there is a, a real desire for spouses to, to want to get one another to heaven. I know, too, that maybe sometimes couples aren't always blessed with children. There isn't always a fruitfulness there. But for those who maybe weren't blessed with children... There might even be, or you might know some people who might be divorced, maybe people who are widowed, and, you know, there's a lot of situations in life that are outside of our control where life didn't turn out quite like we thought it would, yet there is an opportunity to enter into this sacrifice, this sacrifice sacrament, and laying, and I, like I mentioned last night, putting these things on the altar and, and trying to be fruitful for the Lord, but we've got to put things on the altar for the Lord really to be able to enter our hearts. We've got to open our hearts up to him. Because the Lord Jesus certainly, he certainly understood sacrifice. He sanctified sacrifice. And he calls us to enter into this. And so we look at, at Joseph and Mary, St. Joseph, Our Lady, and I, I want to look at a specific instance in the life of the Holy Family for just a few moments. And it's from Luke chapter 2. It's when the Holy Family went to the temple and Jesus stayed behind. So it's, it's the story of the finding of Jesus in the temple. Each year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the Feast of Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to festival custom. After they had completed its days as they were returning, the boy Jesus remained behind in Jerusalem, but his parents did not know it. Thinking that he was in the caravan, they journeyed for a day and looked for him among their relatives and acquaintances. But not finding him, <clears throat> they returned to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astounded at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished, and his mother said to him, Son, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been looking for you with great anxiety. And he said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. He went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. And his mother kept all these things in her heart. And Jesus advanced in wisdom and age and favor before God and man. There's a little bit of turmoil in the Holy Family. Here we've got the 12-year-old Jesus who is truly God and truly man in this mystery of the Incarnation. And in his human nature, Jesus never sinned. And Jesus was, though, very aware of what his mission would be. Did you not know I was to be in my father's house? But he's obedient to Joseph and Mary. And that's what I want to hone in on for a moment. 
is that obedience that he showed because Jesus is God. But in him being obedient, is he somehow less than God by being obedient to Joseph and Mary? No, there was a fullness of, he understood that there was an order in the family. There needed to be a head in St. Joseph. Our Lady was right there next to Joseph, and Jesus was under their care. And that was, that was part that's just on the purely natural level, a husband, a wife, father and mother, and children. And so Jesus, he wasn't just playing along. I mean, it was very much a, a, a natural human family. I mean, this was the unique human family, and, and, but, in the, but natural in the sense that there was a, a father, a mother, foster father, mother and Mary, and Jesus. And so this, this order that they had in the family... There's a, uh, St. Luke uses a, a word, I'm going to throw out a Greek word, I can barely pronounce it, and I'm just saying it so that I can sound smart, that's the only reason I'm using it. But it's an important word, because it shows up somewhere else in the New Testament that I want to draw attention to. And the word is hypotasami, hypotasami, and it, me- it describes the relationship between Mary and Joseph and Jesus. It means, and all the hypotasami means is he was, he was subject to them. He was subject to them. And so he was going to be obedient, but it didn't make him less than God. And there was an order. It helped keep order within the family. Now, the word hypotasami shows up in Ephesians 5. Remember that kind of contentious chapter in Ephesians where it talks about Wives, be submissive to your husbands, and husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. The word that St. Paul uses is the same one St. Luke uses, hypotasami. It doesn't mean that, there's, that wives are to be abused or subservient in some way. It just means to be subject to, for good order, just as there is an order in creation, so too there is an order in the family. Husbands and wives, are, they're co-equals. They're working in this together. They each have a unique role. But there is a head, and there is a heart. The husband is the head, the wife is the heart, and the children fall into that order. And so our families, hopefully, will reflect this order that we see in the Holy Family in some way. Now, you're going to work at trying to have a good Holy Family, and you're going to pray that your children stay in the church, and your grandchildren stay in the church. And you should do that daily. That is part of your responsibility as parents, as aunts, as uncles, as other people in the parish who see families families here. Pray that everyone stay in the church and that they practice the faith. But pray, too, that there be this, this proper ordering of things because there needs to be a head and a heart mother and father, co equals, working together for the sanctification of their family. And what, do, what we see Joseph and Mary doing with Jesus in this particular gospel that I read is that they are going to the temple to worship at Passover time. And so part of this family ordering is going to include this family worship. Family, uh, the Eucharist, and in, in particular, having a focus on the Eucharist. Because as I said last night, if we believe that the priest, through an authority and a service, that he, through his ordination, that he's given this, uh, this, this uh, change, this ontological change, they call it, to change bread and wine into the body and blood of Jesus in order to nourish the church. If we believe that what goes on on the altar, that, that transubstantiation, if we believe that happens, that it's not just ordinary bread and wine, but only a, the appearances of bread and wine, but that what we receive, him who we, re- we receive in the Eucharist is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of, of the second person of the Blessed Trinity, Jesus Christ. If we believe that's going on, then do we believe that all the things that we put on the altar, all of our intentions, all of our struggles, do we believe that God is going, that he's interested in them? That he wants you, because he does, he wants you to put those offerings on the altar. The joys and the sorrows, he wants you to put up there. 
That's why I read you that quote from Lumen Gentium 34. I'm going to read it again. And I want you to think about this. Putting your prayers, works, joys, sorrows, and sufferings, putting all those things on the altar and letting the Lord transform them. Again, Lumen Gentium says, For all their works, prayers, and apostolic undertakings, family and married life, daily work, relaxation of mind and body, if they are accomplished in the Spirit, indeed, even the hardships of life, if patiently born, all these become spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. In the celebration of the Eucharist, these may most fittingly be offered to the Father along with the body of the Lord. And so worshiping everywhere by the, their holy actions, the laity consecrate the world itself to God. So, you put those prayers, works, joys, sorrows, and sufferings on the altar, and the Lord, you leave them there when you leave church and say, Lord, take care of it. I offer you these things. And you go back out in firm faith and confidence, not, not, in, not in ignorance or just a simplistic faith, because it, it's, it takes a persevering faith to make some of these offerings. But it's, it, it's really important in considering just the work that you do, just the general work, you know, at your place of work or, or work in the home, because working in the home is really the greatest work. You've, in family life, You've been called to establish a little domestic church, the, the Ecclesia Domestica, but, but this, little, this little church that has its own little life of prayer that goes on. But everything, you want the faith to be at work in some por- in, at some part of it. And so, looking at, at some of these points from from the, the, the works that you do that Lumen Gentium talks about? How does your faith affect how you act at work? Are you, are you willing to share your faith at work, if it's appropriate? Because sometimes some of you probably work in places where it's not appropriate to talk religion or politics. I mean, it'll just start a fight. And that's not what I'm talking about. But how does your faith affect how you go about your work and your diligence at work? Your family prayer life in the little domestic church. Uh, Father, Father Patrick Payton, the, the famous rosary priest from the 1950s, he said, the family that prays together stays together. And so what, what does your family prayer life look like? Obviously, you're going to Mass, coming to Eucharistic adoration when that's available. But what other things might you do? And you don't have to do all these things that I'm about to list, but what, what might you do? There's obviously the rosary is, is a good one to, to pray the family rosary. I know my family did not always pray the rosary when I was growing up. It was, um, I was probably in junior high. I, I think there were four of us siblings. By, by the time the family got a little more serious about the family prayer life within our little domestic church. It was kind of, as I think back, my, my parents made sure we got to Mass, you know, on Sundays. But we weren't prayer warriors at all. Over time, as we began praying the family rosary, that, that became a, a, a regular part of our, our, fa- our prayer life. And I remember... I remember not liking the rosary very much when mom and dad thought it was a good, time, good deal to pray the rosary. Um, we used to only pray it on vacation. And that was fine because you're going on vacation and so you got a long car ride. And so it made sense to pray the rosary on a car ride, you know. But then, um, then you started praying it at home. And we pray it at night in mom and dad's bedroom, maybe kneeling at the bed. We pray family prayers and a rosary. As we got older, though, we, we started to pray the rosary while we were cleaning up from dishes because us three older kids, uh, my brother and sister and I, we would bicker and fight over who was going to take which kitchen patrol duty. And so dad got tired of the bickering, and rather than get mad at us, he said, we're going to pray the rosary. So as soon as there was the, we were done with supper, he just started the rosary. He knelt down over at his place at the table. He said, 
start, start cleaning up, and then he'd start the family rosary. Now, whether or not it's a good idea to use the rosary as a way to keep your children shut up, I, I, I don't know. That is a prudential judgment that parents have to make. You have to be very mature in your faith to make that decision. But, hey, you know, it, 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 it kept us from bickering, that's for sure. Now, my mind, you know, I, I finally got kind of comfortable praying the family rosary. But then when mom found out about the chaplet of divine mercy, and then we prayed a rosary, and then we started praying the chaplet on top of the rosary, I thought, oh, no, what is this? What are we doing here, you know? Well, all we do is pray all the time. And so we pray a rosary and chaplet in the car. And so there, but <clears throat> to pray always, to persevere in prayer, how do you do that? What does it look like to persevere in prayer? And obviously, we, we've got to communicate with other people. We've got to st have mental focus on work that we're doing at work. We're not going to be consciously praying Hail Marys as we're trying to do our work. It does, yeah, that doesn't work. Trust me, I've, I've tried. Uh, you, 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 need to, you need to stay focused on the work that's in front of you. But how do you pray always? And that's what mom was trying to instill in us. How do you pray always? That's something you have to come to decide. But the Chaplet of Divine Mercy, was a, it was a, it's a prayer that I know my, my parents certainly loved. And I, I mean, I ended up joining a, a religious order. That's, the, that's the, the main image over our, our high altar at our church down in, back in Kentucky, where you have the Holy Spirit we have a painting of Jesus in his divine mercy with the pale ray and the red ray coming out of his, his heart. And he's raising his hand and blessing that, that image of the divine mercy. So I'm very grateful for the chaplet of divine mercy. What is your home? Does it, does it have sacred images around? Do you have images of saints? Do you have images of Our Lady and Our Lord? At least a, an image of the Sacred Heart and the Immaculate Heart. Is there a crucifix in the home to indicate this isn't just a Christian home, but it's a Catholic home? Because there is a distinction, and I love our Protestant brothers and sisters, but some of them, they, they don't like the fact that we still have Jesus on the cross, they say. But we see him on the cross and, and the, the, the beauty and the good in that offering that he made on Good Friday. And that he's not on the cross anymore. He has risen to heaven, and he wants us to follow him there. But that's what the crucifix needs to be a reminder of. And do we have those in our homes? This is something, I'd like to say something distinct to parents and grandparents, and, but, but especially moms and dads. Um, when you pray bedtime prayers with your kids, pray with them. You know, and, and I wouldn't be afraid and maybe you do this, but make a little sign of the cross. Give a little blessing as a parental blessing to your kids. Because you have a it's, not a, it's not a priestly blessing. Priests are ordained to give, to do certain works. But you as parents cooperated with God to bring those children into the world. And so you have a, an authority there. And so ask the Lord to bless your children. And especially dads, I would say... And you can make this kind of something fun, but to, as the, as the leader and the protector and the provider of the home, dads, take some holy water around the house on a regular basis, once a month, a couple times a year, but something, and bless the home. Bless all the rooms in the home. Chase, chase the evil spirits away. There are evil spirits. We have guardian angels who guard us, but there's no doubt there is a juggernaut of evil that wants to disrupt your home. So, take some holy water around. Bless the house. Bless the four corners. Bless the perimeter. That's what they do in the, in the military. They have a perimeter security. Well, you've got perimeter spiritual security. And, and to take advantage of, of those sacramentals that we have. Because this, because what do sacramentals do? Sacramentals stir our faith. They aren't sacraments, per se, but they do stir our faith. And the more that you 
have a desire to love the Lord and to be reminded by those sacred images what, the, what they remind us of, it's going to stir that faith and deepen that faith. So the use of sacramentals, the use of holy water. We've talked about going to Eucharistic adoration and adoring the Lord in the Eucharist and going to Mass. So really a, a, a love of the, the Eucharistic sacrament, but also a, sac- a, a love of the sacrament of, of penance, of confession. I will never forget the time, the first time I saw my dad in line for confession. I was about nine or ten. I was in line for confession, and I thought, I, would, I you know, just kind of casually looked to see who was behind me in line. There's my dad. And I, you know, and dad was kind of a, he could be an intimidating character, and I loved him, you know, but I thought, oh, dad's got to go to confession too. He's got to ask God's forgiveness as well. And that there's something very special about a father's role in helping us and, and really modeling for us God's, God's forgiveness and mercy. There was another instance in my dad's life, I don't know if he ever knew that I, I heard this phone conversation. My dad was on the local public school school board, and it was at the time of year that the school board was negotiating new contracts with the teachers. And, you know, this was a negotiation process, and dad had a threshold of patience. And unfortunately, sometimes that got, you know, once they hit the threshold of his patience, he he might say something that was a little um, barnyard sounding. And so he pops off at one of these teachers who was going back and forth and had gotten on his nerves, and it was, a, it was out of line, and he was wrong. And I remember one evening he called the teacher, and I overheard the conversation, and he, he apologized. He didn't grovel, but he asked for forgiveness, and it was a very brief conversation, a brief phone call, but I remember hearing my dad say, I'm sorry. And there's, that's, that's really, really powerful to, to hear for a, 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 a child to hear one of their parents, but especially their dad, say that he was sorry for something. And I believe that, that part of the reason he was able to do that was because he was going to confession, he was going to Mass on a regular basis. And that was, that was something that, that um, don't, don't underestimate that. Uh, in, in your role as parents, but especially for you dads, as leaders and protectors and providers, uh, to take that role seriously, that, especially that role of demonstrating what it means to ask God's forgiveness and then show that forgiveness and that love of God the Father to your kids. Looking back at, at the Lumen Gentium document, and thinking about some of the apostolic undertakings. Again, we're, we're reflecting on these, these points because you have come to the altar, you've come to adore the Lord, and he's, he's kind of sending you out as missionaries, as his soldiers to go out and, and sanctify the world. So another way you can do that, as a family in particular, through apostolic undertakings. Uh, maybe through, and I don't know what uh, pro-life witness opportunities there are here in the Knoxville area, if there's any Planned Parenthood clinics or, or praying in front of a, an abortion clinic here in, in Tennessee. Uh, that, that can be a, a very moving experience for a family to do that together, to pray together for an end to an abortion. But maybe also volunteering at a, at a soup kitchen Maybe just helping someone in the neighborhood clean out their garage or clean up their yard, but to, you're doing it because you want to be charitable. You want to grow in love. You're not getting paid for it. There is a, 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 a generosity that you're demonstrating through that apostolic undertaking. Through your further daily work, again, I, I already touched on work a little bit, uh, just ways that you, you go to work and try and live your, your um, live as a, a faithful Catholic at work. 
Lumen Gentium brings up uh, relaxation of mind and body, which I'm, I talk, I, I changed it to consider like vacation and recreation. Does your family have fun? Do you, do you have fun as a family? You know, do, is there a, a legitimate and a serious, you know, on Sundays, do you do things that are relaxing? Or is it just more of the humdrum day-to-day -day stuff? Even if it's only for a couple of hours, because maybe you, you do have work. I mean, where we grew up on the farm, we, we fed cattle twice a day, seven days a week. If there were sick animals, we doctored them twice a day, seven days a week. So there, was no, there, there wasn't a lot of, of rest from that. And, but I was grateful my parents made sure there was some fun. And it's a virtue, the virtue of eutropalia, and it's a, a glad-heartedness. But to let, the, you know, when you, when you go on vacation or those times of recreation, make sure that you're planning ahead for Mass. You're going to go to church when you're on vacation. And maybe this is something you could try to do. When you do go on vacation, go look for a church you can visit. Just because you come to Holy Ghost Catholic Church, go see what other churches are out there. See how lucky you are, maybe, in having a church as beautiful as this one. Because one day I'm going to put together a list of the top ten ugliest churches in the United States of America. And let me tell you, there's some doozies. I mean, and especially when you have to look for Jesus, I mean, it's like, it's, where's, where's Jesus? You know the where's Waldo? Well, where's Jesus? And because you, you, can't, you can't find him sometimes because the tabernacle isn't in the front and in the center up where he, where he belongs. But take your family, and, or if you're by yourself, even for your own, you know, you're just with some friends. Plan on going to Mass. And here's a, here's a little cue, though. If you're a little nervous about just going to any church because you're, you have sensi sensitive sensibilities, look in the bulletin and see what time confessions are. That's always my tell, and I, I hope I don't get in trouble for saying this, Father. But when I am scheduled to do a parish mission, one of the things I do is I check to see when are confessions. And if confessions are easily available, that tells me that this is a parish where the sacramental life is alive. So, if you're going on vacation, check to see, check the bulletin. And... and don't tell me you can't check the bulletin, okay? You can check the bulletin five minutes before you think mass is going on because we got these great little tools called smart devices, okay? You can check. You just need to not be lazy about it. But see if the sacramental life is alive at the parish. If you think, ah, this is a little more, a little too broad-minded of a Catholic church. I, I don't think this would be great for my, uh, I don't know if I, I, I can pray here. And that's, that's something you need to know about yourself. But, point being, going on vacation, plan ahead. Go say hi to Jesus on your vacation. And lastly, Lumen Gentium talks about the hardships. The hardships of life, again, those hardships that we place on the altar that can really stretch us the sickness, the financial struggles, uh, the, the sudden unexpected deaths, uh, crises in faith. I mean, you name it. We, we know what those struggles are. Each one of us has those struggles. But to bring those to the altar, because that's, the, the Lord is going to, if you open your heart up, the Lord wants to hear about that. And, and he, wants, he wants you to share that with him. And he's not going to take it out of your hand if you think, well, I can fix it, I can change it, and you just hold it close to your chest. No, put it on the altar, leave it on the altar. And it'll be work to say, Lord, I give this to you. I, I leave it there, Lord, you take care of it. But these are, these are some ways that it, there is this, because we've been nourished by the Eucharist, because we love the Lord, but we also know that we can't stay at church. We have to go out into the world. You've been given a special role as Catholic laity to go out and sanctify the world. 
But you, you, you need God's grace and you need the strength in order to do that. And this is going to be the source of your strength. He is going to be the source of your strength. And so to, to let him help you by being available to him for some time. I would say, just in bringing this talk to a conclusion, um, how important it is for you to also, having, having received the, the Lord in Holy Communion and really um, just laying all of those thoughts and prayers on the altar, relying on the Blessed Virgin Mary and St. Joseph, looking at them as your, your models. And, and you don't have to be, you don't have to make your another holy family because there was one holy family and there can't be another holy family. But you can strive for holiness within your family. You can be a holy family. And so to, to ask them to intercede on your behalf. Because the Lord very much needs your witness out in the world. And he will use you if you will let him. And so we just give him honor and praise this day. And as we look forward to this Lenten season, it's my prayer that all of you have a very blessed Lent. And at the end of this 40 days, we'll celebrate a very joy-filled Easter. Praise to be Jesus Christ, now and forever. Amen.